welcome to the panel discussion today you know welcome to the panelists welcome to the audience uh, i'm looking forward to today's discussion i am ajay agrawal from iit kanpur currently a wealth manager at set point financial which is owned by advisor group in a previous life i was a uh, managing director for uh, of disha india in hyderabad and one of our uh, constant uh, one of our challenges was continually keep uh, recruiting top notch engineers in india uh, which one would think is a piece of cake considering you know there are thousands of engineering colleges in india right well uh, let me introduce the moderator let me uh, rakesh jaggi is going to be the moderator moderator for today's discussion and uh, as uh, uh, senior vice president currently rakesh leads global sales and commercial at shlumberger and rakesh is not an easy person to keep up with after graduating from iit delhi he started with shlumberger in india and then has traveled the globe holding leadership roles in trinidad trinidad colombia mexico south america middle east asia we finally tracked them down in houston so so we finally got hold of rakesh rakesh has a passion for education and is a founder and a trustee of not one but two universities the ashoka university in sonipat and the plashka university in mohali punjab well um, rakesh welcome over to you thank you very much ajay uh, very kind of you um, thanks for your uh, for my introduction so i am actually privileged and honored to introduce the two panelists that i have with us uh, on the on the on the session today so i have dr punendu chatterji who is the founder and chairman of the chatterji group the pcg group which was founded in 1989 pcg is a premier industrial holding entity with investments and in operations uh, spanning several continents and in several industries as well Uh, under dr chatterjee's leadership a tcg has garnered over 3 decades of experience in leveraged acquisitions of operating companies and other private equity transactions the most recent one being the acquisition of the us based glamus technology from mcdermott international uh, vibrant enterprises in financial services in pharma in life sciences it software products engineering not to mention petrochemicals chemicals and real estate comprise uh, its indian uh, investment portfolio as well Dr Chatterjee's background combines expertise in technology management consulting and international investing. He has been a partner at McKinsey and, and company. Um, he advised leading companies on strategic, organizational and operational issues in that uh, uh, um, in McKinsey. As an investment advisor for the Soros fund management, he was responsible for investments over 3 billion dollars uh, around the globe. I think uh, coming closer to the topic which is at hand presently, um, he is one of the primary founders of the Indian School of Business. and the advanced vlsi design lab at it kharagpur as well he is uh, passionately committed to promoting entrepreneurship as the key to india's economic development i think one of his uh, new initiatives which i am very excited about personally as well he has recently set up the tcg center for research and education in science and technology called the tcg crest or the crest uh, uh, alone it's a not for profit entity that aspires to become a leading science and technology research institute of the world to accelerate a harmonious future for for the mankind he dr chatterjee received a btech from the iit kharagpur and an msc and phd in industrial engineering and or from the uc berkeley so welcome uh, to the group uh, punendu we are glad to have uh, you join us in the session let me also introduce the other panelist uh, who's a dear friend and i feel privileged and honored uh, to invite pramath uh, raj sinha on the on the panel as well Pramath is a founder and chairman at Harappa Inst- uh, ed- Education, and also a founder and trustee at Ashoka University. Um, you know, we've been associated in, uh, uh, as a result of our uh, both our association in, at Ashoka. Pramath is a pioneering force in Indian higher education. He is the founder and chairman of Harappa Education that I just talked about, which strives to become India's largest online institution focused on teaching habits and skills critical to workplace success in the 21st century. he is the founding dean and member of the executive board of isb uh, so he was associated with um, isb just like punendu which rapidly became one of the top 20 business schools in the world he is also the founder and trustee of the acclaimed ashoka university a liberal arts university which launched the popular young india fellowship program i may add i have to say he has been the leading light and his experience has actually gu- you know guided us all as we set the ashoka university Pramath has been instrumental in setting up wide spectrum of change based higher education initiatives including a management program for career oriented women 
an entrepreneurship fellowship for the Himalayan region and a solution focused design education for the built environment. He has also been a media entrepreneur, education consultant and management advisor at the 9.9 group, which he founded the CEO of the Anand Bazaar Patrika group and a partner at McKinsey and company earlier in his uh, life as well. Academics clearly are his first love. He received a PhD and an MSc from the University of Pennsylvania, UPenn, and a BTEC from uh, the IIT Kanpur, where he was honored with the Distinguished Alumnus Award in the year 2018. Gentlemen, it's, it's great to have you both here. So maybe I should pass the floor on to Purnendu, who could give us a quick um, overview about his uh, new initiative, The Crest, and tell us a little bit about how is that progressing along. Good afternoon, or uh, yeah, it's good afternoon even in, in uh, California, and good evening to all of you in India. Um, it really is a great pleasure to talk about Crest to fellow IITians. Uh, you know, this morning, Prime Minister Modi ji mentioned about Atma Nirvar, as well as contributing to the uh, rest of the world. And what I want to talk about is fairly aspirational towards that aspect of contribution. And we need help from the whole IIT diaspora, because I believe it's the strongest diaspora of its kind. And if we can come together, it will be very, very exciting. So Centers for Research and Education in Science and Technology and we talk about invent a harmonious future. So to tell about this story, I thought I'd take you 10 years from now, let's say on a Sunday afternoon, December 1, 2030, you are reading your favorite newspaper. And if you are in, since I'm in New York, I'm in New York reading the New, New York Times. And uh, there are, uh, four interesting stories. One, and this is all speculative at this point, of course. One is an US FDA approves an Alzheimer drug for memory stabilization that's based on pluripotent stem cells with CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology. The story number two is Tesla just launched a 600 miles per charge heavy duty truck from 3D printed solid state battery made from materials synthesized using quantum chemistry algorithm on a quantum computer. Story number three, backlog of Indian judicial system has been dramatically reduced. There are no cases beyond 18 months. And in July 2020, as a reference, there are 4.3 million cases in top 25 courts of India. And of that, 800,000 cases exceeded 10 years. If there are no cases filed, it will take about 360 years for the current judiciary to deal with the backlog. So all this has been done we are using AI, ML, natural language processing on all aspects of judiciary. And the judges are issuing reasoned orders, but leveraging NLP. And the story number four is Satyajit Ray's Pathe Panchali has been reinterpreted in a global competition and a Turkish director won the Oscar from Critical, you know, 30 critically acclaimed submissions and used AI, ML, AR, VR technique and discipline like that to create this uh, content. So although these are speculative, what is interesting is some of the work of these kinds are already going on in Crest. So let me talk about what we have there is we have right now four centers operating. We have four under launch and we plan to launch about three, four every year till we achieve a critical mass of at least 20 centers with global recognition. 
So the four operational centers, our first is called Chinta, that collaboration with Weill Cornell, New York University, Edinburgh University, and Francis Lee is a SAB chairman, and it's focused on neurodegenerative disease using pluripotent stem cells. And that's the reason for the, if they are successful, they could do something and that's the story number one. The second center that's operating is Center for Quantum Engineering and for Research and Education called Secure. And we have Professor Eckert from Oxford University as a SAB chairman. Nakamura Nomori, they're very well-known Japanese uh, quantum scientists are also working with us. And so we have collaboration with CQT in Singapore, Oxford, Tokyo, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and probably have some of the best algorithm team in India. And with Omori's team, we are working on cold atoms. The third center is RISE Research Institute for Sustainable Energy. That's where we are doing the battery research. And it's a collaboration between second and third that I've speculatively talked about the story number two, which is coming up with a battery for heavy duty trucks. The fourth center is really the pivotal center, which is Institute for Advancing Intelligence, which is dealing with AI, ML, both from math stat point of view, as well as use in the all domains. And there the collaborations are with UC Berkeley, my alma mater, University of Chicago, Chennai Mathematical Institute, IIT, Kharagpur, ISI, and Rajiva Karandekar is the director there. So under launch is a center called Raje, which is Research Academy for Juridical Excellence. And the work there that we are doing is part of the story number three, which is backlog reduction in Indian judicial system. The, another center is cinema, center for new media. And that's where we are trying to understand how to get from director's mind to the audience's subconscious for entertainment. I asked my physics friends to saying, if quantum mechanics was to understand the nature of nature, why can we not think about what is the nature of quantum mechanics of entertainment? So again, AI, ML, and other things have been used to think about that. The two other centers is one is for Center for Advanced Study of Economics, dealing with economics of new technology in which we not take all Bitcoins and things like that. And fourth center is AI, in agriculture and food. So we will be probably calling that Food Technology and Science Institute, FTSI. So we're trying to achieve critical mass in each one of these. What that means is world-class, intense world-class collaboration on high impact problems that we get to have world-class talent our thinking is that in order to get world-class talent, this university cannot be only in India. It is of course, where well, we hope that we have a campus in Silicon Valley or someplace in the uh, West Coast, maybe New York and maybe near London. Because this is the only way we can, we think we can get the talent density and talent diversity, which is essential for cutting edge research. And this will be enable us to do intense global collaboration with other universities, corporate labs, and startups. We are currently giving only PhD and masters. Undergraduate will come later after we achieve stability. And we are committed to lifelong learning and some of the things that I'm learning from 
Pramat, which is my co-panelist here. So we have research and education together, science and technology coexisting, social science and humanities are very much integral part of it because we think solving big problems requires multidisciplinary approach. So finally, I think we cannot achieve this mission without the help of IIT diaspora, because it's an incredibly talented, successful people. Has, we have had understanding of each other because we spent the life, at least four or five years of our life in a similar way, in hostels and all, got deep connections with the IITs. And you are facing, you have, you know some of the problems, you know some of the people and network and we can bring it together. And I will say, if those who want to help us can write to me at pc at tcgcrest.com. I will discuss more about it during Q&A. Thank you very much. That's all about Crest right now. Nindu, clearly your uh, your um, excitement about uh, about research, you know, shown through that particular um, uh, um, you know um, sh session that you shared with us. So I'd actually like to pass the floor on to Pramath. So it's interesting. Purnindu is coming from the fact that that he's only focusing on the PhDs and the masters, and Pramath is actually at the other spectrum, shall I say? He started a liberal arts university in India, the Ashoka University, and is also working on the the, the Harappa education, the initiative which actually is um, helping us not just, you know, provide technical education, but the soft skills that are necessary as well. So, Pramath, uh, could you share with the audience a little bit about your journey and, um, you know, how have you come up with the, the initiatives of um, Ashoka and, and Harappa and where they stand presently? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, Rakesh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. And uh, given what PC has just talked about, I think I what I've done will pale in comparison, but I quickly uh, cover off by, I got very involved in setting up ISB and uh, PC of course was part of that journey and that's how we have been quite close over the years. Uh, obviously led by Rajat Gupta who was leading McKinsey at that time where I was working. And then I went on to become the first Dean of ISB. I think if you, if you will, I kind of first cut my teeth there uh, on, uh, I, I, I never did an MBA, so I was the wrong choice, but uh, maybe because I didn't do an MBA, I looked at it from a, almost a clean sheet perspective. Uh, interesting contrast to what PC is talking about. I think what, what we have found is that if you want to build truly world-class institutions in India, the exciting part is that you can actually do it from day one. Uh, the, and that's a kind of a counterintuitive view. A lot of people have built institutions in India and are building institutions in India by, by saying, let's start something small and something modest. And over a period of time, we'll scale up the quality, right? So maybe we, we can't be tier one or, or A class from day one. So let's start with whatever we can. And maybe over time, 10 years, 15, 20, 50 years, we'll become uh, a top-notch institution. And I think the generation of uh, people behind ISB, Ashoka, now what you're doing at Plaksha have fundamentally challenged that and said, we don't have the luxury of time and we need to do this now. Can this be done? And how can we do it? And there's, in some ways, while PC is talking about very high end research and what we were doing at ISB and at Ashoka was starting with high end teaching and education uh, of, of students, the underlying model is the same. You know, how do you disaggregate the teaching and research? Because there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. If PC was trying to do undergraduate education and start doing students, he wouldn't be able to do the high-end research he's talking about. Uh, and if we were trying to do high-end research in, in ISB and Ashoka from day one, then we would be able to do the teaching we are talking about because the whole uh, approach to teaching 
uh, has been enabled by a very innovative visiting faculty model that we created at ISB, which then we replicated at the Young India Fellowship at Ashoka. And by the way, Rakesh, that you all have replicated at, at Plaksha uh, with the Plaksha Fellowship. So uh, the first thing I wanted people to understand is that part of what you, me, PC are all doing is really challenging age old wisdom to say, how do you build world class top notch institutions from day one? And I'm, 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 I'm sparing you the details of that because I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about that. But that's a fundamental shift in the way India is now or entrepreneurs or who are who are committing to building educational institutions are committing to this, whether it's Kriya or Geo or Shiv Nadar or OP Jindal and so on. I think my journey from ISB went on to uh, having been at uh, uh, doing my PhD at Penn, where I came from a very intense tech environment at IDK to uh, you pen to do a PhD, which was in robotics, I suddenly realized that even though I was studying something intensely technologically uh, 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 complex uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago in, in, in the field of robotics, uh, being in a liberal arts environment made a tremendous amount of difference. I was working with cognitive scientists. Uh, I was working with philosophers, mathematician, uh, mathematicians, linguists, and so on and so forth. And suddenly I realized that there's a whole world out there. So when the opportunity came to build Ashoka, uh, that whole experience of the contrast between being at IIT, I mean, we did take pride in the fact that we used to do humanities and social science courses, Rakesh and, and PC and all of us know. But at the end of the day, they were kind of a co-curricular rather than mainstream in, in, in our education. Uh, we all took them as, as kind of some of us who were interested in the novelty of studying something outside of engineering, enjoyed this and others kind of did it more as an obligation. And so the opportunity to do something which was pure liberal arts uh, and to bring the liberal arts, not the subjects, but the liberal education ethos, because one of the big things that I was always struck by by my IIT education was that I was forced to study a subject based on my JEE rank. And uh, that has really rankled uh, for, for a long time uh, that, you know, I spent four years studying a subject and I couldn't get out of it because either you had to drop a year and take JE again or pass the JAT, which was like hundredfold more difficult than JE. And we've all lived through that. What I saw in the West was fundamentally the fact that higher education is about giving students choice and flexibility. Uh, your own daughter, Rakesh, went to Penn, I think. And, uh, you know, when you go for a liberal arts education in the United States, you uh, don't have to even pick a major. And even if you did, you can switch your major. You can do a major and a minor or a double major or a concentration. And it's the act of being able to choose and the flexibility that you get, get which really gives you tremendous amounts of confidence that I feel like some of us didn't get in the Indian system which has become even more rigid over the years. And so essentially what Ashoka does, what Plaksha does is to the undergraduate student says, hey, listen, come play. We, here's all that is on offer. There are certain rules. You have to pick a certain number of courses if you want a major, if you want to specialize, but hey, you can do music and math and you can do history and computer science. And that's what's happening. So I think that's been the other exciting part of the journey is one, being able to think about building educational institutions of very high caliber from day one. And second, giving students choice and flexibility. And it doesn't matter whether it's liberal arts at Ashoka or technology at Plaksha, the underlying philosophy is put the onus or put the power back in the hands of students. Uh, and, and that's the second exciting thing. The last thing I'll say and I shut up is I am convinced and I have never been more convinced that we will not solve the challenge of educating young people in India if we do not use technology. And the big difference that people have to understand is that in India, our students have no other option 
but to study online. Because in the 75 years of independence, we have not been able to bring the classroom to them, much less bring good faculty to them. Now, the big constraint with the challenge that we have ahead of us is that there are 40 million students in higher education in India today. That number is going to go to 90 million. It's staggering. Never in the history of the human race have we had to educate so many people so quickly. And we are trying to solve the model, which is teacher-student ratio and how many classes can a teacher physically teach and how many classrooms can be built. It ain't going to work. We are never going to get there. So for us, technology is, a, is the only option. And unlike the West, where technology is being used to substitute the classroom and provide a lower cost education in India, it is the only way you can provide education. And so that's what I'm trying to do with Harappa. But there, the last thing I will say is that I'm also trying to address a big gap uh, that has existed in education and it's become worse over time. And that's the gap that because of the tremendous amount of competition and rote learning and very rigid curricula, our young people are not getting an opportunity to learn how to think, how to fundamentally solve problems, how to communicate well, how to collaborate and work with each other, and really become much more self-aware and take charge of their own growth and development. Unfortunately, we've kind of plugged all of this under the label of soft skills. These are anything but soft. As we all know, these are really hard skills. And so, I want to solve the challenge of saying, can we teach these soft skills through technology at scale in a very high quality manner? And that's what Harappa tries to do. Let others solve for teaching people digital marketing or data analytics or even an online MBA. But what I'm trying to do is come at it from the point of saying, can we use technology to actually teach the really tough stuff? Because if you can solve that challenge, then teaching people thermodynamics or fluid dynamics will be much easier if you can teach them how to think and how to communicate and how to be great team members. So that's been my journey, Rakesh, and I've kind of meandered a little bit in telling you how I've come at it. But the three big pieces are really Building high quality institutions from day one, we have to do it, can be done. Giving students choice, flexibility, and let, letting them chart their own path. And third, using technology to teach the stuff of the future rather than just the stuff of what already exists and the stuff of the past. I'll stop here, thank you. Fantastic, Pramath. You know, it's it's very interesting. I know Pramath for many years. Every time you get him talking about education, the passion comes through. So as he points out, three very critical things, right? You can be great from number uh, the day one. And I think, you know, we try to live that in Plaksha and in Ashoka, very right, right, rightly said. And then make sure that, you know, uh, you give them the liberal arts. You know, holistic education is very important. And then the third, if technology has to play a critical role in India. I think points very well made, Pramath. So... What I'm going to try and do is maybe I'll, I'll uh, ask a couple of questions and I'll go to Pramath first. Pramath, you know, we now have a private education and private institutions becoming a, playing a larger role in the Indian education spectrum of late specifically in the last few years. But there is still the school of thought which believes that, you know, the, there are some sectors like the education, maybe the healthcare to a certain extent, where we should not have a private involvement, the private companies or private you know, individuals involvement because you know, we will not be able to do just to the average uh, citizen. How would you respond? No, uh, I, I, I think the, that both have to exist. And uh, I think the government and the public system absolutely has an obligation to educate the last student. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have the resources to get to all of them. And therefore, the private sector has to come and play a role. And by the way, I don't know if you know, uh, Rakesh, now the numbers are staggering. We have the highest proportion of education provided by the private sector, both in K-12 and in higher education. K-12 is approaching 50% or more, which is the highest in the world. Most countries actually have private sector participation in K-12 less than 10%. 
if you look at higher ed, uh, you know, across Europe, there are no private universities. They are all public. Uh, in India, that number has actually started to touch 70%. Again, the highest ever in the world. There are no private universities in China, for example. So it's a reality that it's, there's going to be a large proportion of private. But equally, uh, for all of us who are, even though we are doing philanthropic private, and there's large amounts of scholarships that ISB and Ashoka and I'm sure Plaksha and others do, uh, we do need the public system to provide affordable, but high quality. And that's where I think we are falling short. While we are expanding access, access is still not equal and access is still not high quality. Excellence is missing from both the private and the public sector. And I think that is the bigger problem. That's criminal, what we are doing to young people in our country. I again want to tell you that uh, I'm working on a very exciting project for the government and I, I've never talked about this before. Uh, and I, I, I may, I, I, we, I, I'm allowed to talk about it now because we are about to launch it. The beta version is out. But basically uh, what we are helping do is launch an online initiative, Rakesh, that will bring the very best quality courses for everyone. Initially, we are actually making it free and we are getting free content from Coursera, edX, Swayam, Khan Academy and Harappa and others, where we are saying, if you're a student in India, here's the very best course on microeconomics. We've curated this for you, go ahead and take it, right? Or here's the very best course on thermodynamics. It was my nightmare subject at at IIT, so I always take that as an example, right? Can we get the very best teacher who teaches thermodynamics with a lucidity and a simplicity and a, in a way that anybody can understand it and make it available to everybody? And you can today do that. You can do that for free. Tarun Khanna's course on edX, and he's an entrepreneurship professor at, uh, at, at HBS, which actually deals with largely Indian entrepreneur case studies. It's a course on entrepreneurship. Uh, if you do the free course without the certification from HBS, it's free. And every year, 420,000 students across Africa and Asia and India take that course. But today students in India who are studying in business schools, every Indian business school student should be taking that course because it's a fantastic course and it's actually about Indian entrepreneurship, but they don't know about it. So that's what we are trying to do. And I think that's where, while the government spending and the proportion of students and so on, which we calculate today based on the numbers inside the classroom and how much the government is spending versus the private sector is spending, Technology can completely change that ratio. And only the government can take this stance to say, listen, we'll build you a platform. And by the way, Arvind Krishna, uh, who's an IIT Kanpur uh, uh, alum as well and was two years my senior, has made the IBM team available for us to build this pro bono. Uh, so this is a public private collaboration and, you know, I think we can do initiatives like this, which completely change the model from saying, listen, you don't need 4,000 courses that Coursera has. You actually need 250 courses to teach 80% of the majors that people need to study to be employable, which is the last student. And you can actually provide them the highest quality courses uh, of, of whatever is available online. So I do think that that's my response to your question and sorry, sorry about the long-winded response, but I wanted to plug in this idea that again, the answer to this is not whether it's public or private, but really raising the game using technology, uh, where actually the cost of doing this is at almost zero compared to what it is to set up a new IIT or to build a network of them. Right, no, I think that's some very pertinent information. So may I ask you a follow-up? Pramath, in that case, you know, um, uh, you know, you're, you've been uh, associated with ISB and then with Ashoka and now Harappa as well. Is it fair to state that the government is becoming more open 
and uh, we oh, have yeah. less obstacles being put in uh, uh, you know for uh, private institutions and private uh, you know individuals to be able to contribute to the sector would that be a fair comment yes uh, rakesh and i would say that while obviously that we blame the government a lot for a lot of things and the government has had to put in very stringent laws and sometimes draconian laws because you know some of our brethren do uh, do damage uh, with what they do with education so the government ends up putting in place laws and and regulations to control the worst offenders which does collateral damage to those of us who want to do the right thing as well and it becomes a constraining thing but i will also say that in net net if i look at my own involvement over the last 25 years if you are doing the right thing the government generally supports you otherwise you know we would not be successful with having created isb or building ashoka or what you are doing at plaksha and so on so i do think that uh, yes and the government has become much more open i mean if you look at the national education policy and the kinds of things it's talking about or even the way i was roped in to help build this platform right it's unprecedented the kind of free reign or rope that i was given to bring ideas and build a consortium and so on so i think there's a great amount of openness and uh, those doors keep opening wider and wider so i'm very hopeful that that the the challenge is humongous the scale of what we have to do is is truly unprecedented uh, and uh, i think the openness is there though to take on some of these challenges yeah and every every drop is required uh, you know to fill the ocean so i think um i'm glad to hear our experience both at ashoka and plaksha has been the same that's actually one of the interesting lessons i've learned as well right through this journey that in fact you know for the right intentions you have a lot of support happening as well on that note i like to bring purnendu into the discussion and ask him about the involvement of the government uh, on the high end research uh, as far as india is concerned how are they responding to the initiative like crest because as we know in the west even especially in the us the government of the us has actually spent a lot of money a lot of the fundamental research is actually funded many years ago many decades ago actually by the government so what is your experience about the government um, and and its approach when we talk about the high end research in india what would you say well rakesh you know the the governments today what we were uh, you were asking and pranath was answering the there is a compulsion for government to go online or use technology because the size of the problem is so big if research doesn't happen it is not necessarily a problem that anybody can point to so if you look at today india whatever research gets done it's mostly government funded and there is corporate research is almost maybe not even 0.01% so research ecosystem in india is not very good which we all know that's why you have not seen too many new products coming out of india not even too many new software products even though we have so many software engineers now it's happening uh so i would say that you know my approach to this at this point is not to rely on government funding because we we have seen in the various other and in the isb cases we 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 actually had problems with the government in terms of giving quote on quote are we really legal and pramod and you some of you know about all of this but the government has a bias towards control and that bias will not shift over night so the reason i have focused on the higher education one of the reason of the research ecosystem is actually i don't need too many permissions at this point right. and hopefully if we do good stuff we will be able to seek grants in some of the areas so we have talked to the uh, prime minister scientific advisor very supportive of the quantum initiative that we have because government has taken quantum mission but there is still not necessarily a mechanism for getting funding 
directly to our center from the government. Of course, we have not asked for it yet. So I think that change will take place slower than the change will take place in allowing private sector to enter the uh, higher education aspect. And one comment very interesting would be, see, it's not about, the problem is higher education is expensive and to deliver it, it costs a lot of money. And what government should think about is a mixed model, which is maybe it's privately managed and run, but publicly funded, similar to charter school concept over here. Right. No, I think that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, opinion there. So I think maybe Crest would be a path breaker in that sense, you know, with the experience that uh, and the results that uh, Purnendu and, and the team uh, in Crest is able to deliver, maybe that will give uh, more incentive to other uh, organizations and other individuals to actually also start to put in more effort into, uh, you know, doing some research, high-end research, because as, as Purnendu rightly points out, that is lacking a little bit. So, so changing the track a little bit, maybe I, I'd like to bring in the NEP 2020 into the discussion. So, um, Purnendu, um, you know, the NEP 2020 is, of course, a welcome step. Um, uh, since the last education policy change happened almost 34 years ago. So I was wondering um, uh, if you can shed light on a couple of things, maybe one or two that you are most excited about in the NEP 2020, and also your opinion about did it do enough vis-a-vis uh, -vis the private uh, participation as far as education is concerned, and did it do enough about addressing your, uh, you know, your, um, shall I say, passion about uh, research going forward? So Rakesh, since I have not studied NEP 2020, I'll let Pramath, who is an expert in this matters, you know, sure. illuminate, and I will uh, learn from that. Sure, absolutely. Pramath, this is Pr Pramath's expertise, as, as Purnendu rightly points out. I, I like how nicely uh, uh, PC uh, passed it on to me here, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and address some of these. So firstly, the uh, NEP 2020, you know, uh, Rakesh covers both uh, all, all levels of education. And uh, I would say that while our topic is higher ed, uh, the fundamentally the most important uh, theme in NEP is around the foundational learning uh, for school children. Uh, it has been proven through lots of uh, existing research, including in, in neuroscience and so on, where we had a speaker earlier, that fundamentally, if you don't teach uh, language, uh, writing, and math to young kids, you know, in the range of sort of I don't know exactly now, remember exactly now, but zero to grade five, right? Or grade one to grade five, then you affect their learning forever. Whatever their IQ. And, and this has been kind of now. So one of the things that for the first time the NEP recognizes is this whole area of foundational learning and, and creating that as a mission. And our friend Ashish Dhawan has been driving that as, as well. But I, I do want to recognize that. But, you know, by the time kids come to higher education, we've already damaged them. And so it's very important to even as a higher ed person think, how, how can we go back down the change and fix the problem? So I think that's one big thing that's happening in NEP. So the first time we are acknowledging as a country that we have to focus on foundational learning. Otherwise, we are losing the game right there. You know, it's like a 2020 game where right in the first five overs, it's over for many, many young kids being born in our country. I think the second big thing, and there's many strains, but if you put all of that together is this whole idea, which of really a holistic and a multidisciplinary education. I think that's been a theme that we've all been talking about. Even if you look at PC's centers, you know, he goes from batteries to movies, right? He goes from uh, legal cases to uh, 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 genetics. So I think 
that multidisciplinarity and around that a holistic development of the student and these are words that unfortunately we've been putting into these neps even 34 years ago and not doing anything about uh have come out much stronger and in a much more concert, uh, in a in a much more concerted and consistent way throughout school college and vocational training and that's actually a welcome sign i think the and i'm sorry to keep uh, hopping on this but the recognition of online and technology uh, though not as boldly as i would have liked to see uh, is another welcome sign because i like i said i i am convinced that if you don't focus on that none of this will even happen i mean how are you going to provide holistic multidisciplinary foundational learning to 25 million kids being born every year if you don't use technology and at high quality so i do think that those three themes but equally the nep does recognize that uh, the 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 that technology is going to play a very important role i am of course probably doing not enough justice to the nep because you know the nep also talks about vocational training and introducing vocational training at high school and college levels which by the way for a large number of our kids is very important uh, from an employability perspective and as you know that system is very well developed in the united states through the community college system or in 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 europe through the apprenticeship model which we need to bring into india because far too many people are getting left behind because they are coming out with no skills uh, forget about half skills so those are some of the big themes the challenge with all of these rakesh is that this is a policy document so it's it's like making a a vision statement and a value statement and a mission statement those of us who are involved in businesses know how much that means if you don't actually walk the talk if you don't actually get that stuff implemented on a everyday basis in every situation in every meeting in every interaction with every customer and that is indeed the challenge uh, i think the reason we didn't do it we didn't revise it for 34 years because we kept trying to implement the earlier nep for 34 years and weren't successful that day uh, so we said one day said finally let's throw the book out and let's start again now i'm not skeptical i think the government is making the right moves right now and we have a government that is very proactive and they are saying hey we said something we'll do it we won't allow this to languish for 34 years uh let's see if we are able to pull it off yeah, but rakesh think- one of the thing that needs to happen even when you deal with this large scale problems is not how education is delivered you know the the technology can deal with the de- delivery aspect of it to some extent it is how people absorb that material and that's a big research question to me and i don't think even in india research on education for different classes of society has been undertaken in a very serious way so i think that's another problem that we have unless you are informed with facts you know just delivering materials does not necessarily mean you have done the job just like sometimes you know the the people saying okay we have allocated so much in the budget thereby we are doing something but that's not outcome focused that is input focused no well said well said so uh, purnindu while i have you there is a question from one of the audience members who is basically asking that you know he heard you say that you've started with phd's and masters is there a timeline that you can share as to when you intend to get into undergrad education yeah so am i our objective on undergraduate education i think the undergraduate education will change dramatically over the next 10 years for this just the last point i made is not about delivery it's about absorption okay and so yes these online courses are there they are very good but you still need maybe tas and others as a way of making sure the kids are absorbing the thermodynamics course that is there where are they having difficulty so and i've been involved with this berkeley college of engineering as an advisory board member and a very intensely 
watching various experiments that are getting done, even for teaching computer science to all Berkeley undergraduates. And there, those experiments are slowly succeeding. So our objective of starting undergraduate is first we want to make sure that these research center stabilizes, which provides the faculty base that I need later on. You know, one of the things we, Pramath and I know from our ISP experience, the biggest difficulty in ISP was getting good faculty. So we had to have the visiting faculty. Luckily in business, there was enough Indian diaspora helping that aspect of coming and teaching as a visiting scholar. So these, these 20 centers or X number of centers that we create, if they get critical mass, we'll have the faculty base of high quality. And then by that time, and a parallel path, I believe these undergraduate education will go through quite a bit of change, at least in the US, and one can learn how this online model, which is, if you think about it, all educational material is open source. Mm. Now, open source to be used and create useful products is not that easy. So I think by this time period, next, let's say next five, seven, eight years, and one of the centers that we are going to create is this education technology center. We haven't found the right team to think about that. And we will start undergraduate maybe in five years from now, and then slowly scale as the education at undergraduate level is changing. Now, Georgia Tech has got a very, very important program in thinking about how to even advise people during the four year period as to what courses they should take and what is the way they, you know, the advising itself will change. So there's a, undergraduate education is a very complex area. And I think we need more research-based intervention mechanism. So for the very high end gifted child is one thing. For average skill building, is different. For vocational skill buildings, those are different. So I think we want to, since we are research focused, trying to create an innovation uh, system, a vibrant innovation system for the global need, we want to stay the undergraduate also for the very high-end activities and not get very uh, too broad, too fast. Well, and I like well I like Pramat's original original comment is how do you become excellent from day one? Right. And that is what we are also trying to do through Crest. And we feel by staying in touch with the global best, we can achieve excellence from day one. Yeah, no, well said. I think, you know, the experience that uh, you both had, and I think the larger team had with setting up with ISB, it was very clear that I think, you know, good teachers would make uh, great schools uh, in the future. And we've actually tried to inculcate that, incorporate that both in the ventures that I've been involved in, both at Ashoka and at Plaksha. And maybe this is an opportunity for me to do a little bit of uh, drum beating for Plaksha as well. So sure. Plaksha, uh, as an engineering school, is actually going to start its first undergrad batch in the summer of 2021. So the, the admissions are open, you know, for those of you who are interested or have, uh, you know, relations back home. And also, of course, people who are interested in studying back home in India from here, you know, you're welcome to visit us in plaksha.org. It will give you the required information. I also want to make an interesting comment that, you know, our fellow panelist Ajay makes, uh, Pramat, to your point, he actually says that does it even make sense to continue investing education dollars in setting up physical universities at all, given the experience that we've had from the pandemic? Maybe, as you point out, with Harappa and so on, that maybe the focus should be on the technology and, and, and move more and more in that direction. Look, I'm going to bring up uh, another topic, which is of personal interest to me, right? So I think uh, Ajay mentioned, I've had the fortune of living in many countries um, you know, globally. Uh, and the more I read, the more I travel, I see that there are great universities of the East, 
whether we talk about the Lomonosov or Moscow State University or the National Taiwan University or even the University of Sao Paulo here in, in Brazil. You know, even when we talk about the great universities in the East, um, we are not, you know, Indian universities don't get a mention yet, Pramat. Uh, any, your views on that? And, you know, what is it that we are missing? When will we get there, you feel? Uh, I think we are still 20, 25 years away uh, from there. Uh, I, I, I think it's not easy to catch up in the business of higher education though so easily, unless you pour in the kind of resources that China and Russia and Singapore and so on have poured in over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, we are late to that game. To give you an, a simple example, a lot of the universities that you mentioned, uh, Rakesh, at least in China and Russia, came out of this uh, C9 program that China started uh, almost 30 years ago, where they said, we'll get nine of our universities. They, 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 they scanned their system and they said, we'll take nine universities who seem most well positioned and we will pour in resources, unlimited, and get them into the top 100. And by the way, they did that. And I don't know what that number has now become, but I know that the first step they took was to, once they did that, was to take C9 to C30. So if we are now going to take our 30 top universities and put them in, right? Uh, and I don't know if they've expanded that. Russia, Russia had that, had a top 500 program where they said that we'll take our top five universities and put them into the hundred. It's not the only thing, but listen, Rakesh, it needs resources. It needs the kind of funding where you can attract faculty and do the kind of thing that PC is doing. I mean, honestly, PC is funding Crest entirely by himself because he can, and he's basically acting like the government. Uh, he, he, he could be the National Science Foundation of India is, is TCG, Crest, right? So. I don't mean to belittle what the government does, but I think our resources are really stretched compared to what these guys are investing behind their universities. Uh, we just started the Institutions of Eminence program, uh, and that was actually a response, but you know, it's 25 years too late, 20 years too late. And again, instead of doing the top 10 years, which is how at least some of us who had been involved in had we now do doing top 30, and it's not clear to me that, again, we will have enough resources to focus on the top 30. And we've taken some strange decisions like, and I, I'm particularly smarting from it because IIT Kanpur was not included in that. I mean, you've got the oldest, one of the best IITs and you've chosen to leave them out. And that now you are actually going to allow this institution to languish, right? Uh, so I do think that somewhere our democratic model of spreading our resources equitably across our institutions uh, is going to hurt us because excellence is a brutal sort of, uh, you know, it's not a leveler. It, 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 you, you, you have to leave a few people behind and, and make a few people stand out if you want to achieve excellence. We have not so far been really willing to do that. The reason I say it's 20, 25 years away is that somewhere that fundamental thinking is shifting. So the IOE program has done that. Some of the new universities we are all involved in building, which are more private sector are doing that, but it takes time to catch up. I mean, while, while we are doing what we are trying to do very high quality, you need scale. What, one of the things people don't realize is that quality and scale in fact go together in higher education. And it's counterintuitive because most people think you have to be small to be high quality, but you know you have to scale up to generate resources and to have a critical mass of faculty, students, research, right? And to that extent, I'm a little bit where, to, in response to Ajay's question, you will still need brick and mortar institutions, at least in the current model. I think what PC is doing is doing brick and mortar if you want to build excellence. Also, so, I think what are some of the, the responses to your question. 
Pramod, your your point about quality and scale goes hand in hand together. It also have one other dimension. One not only the scale provides the resource, but some of the newer problems requires large number of people. Correct. Thirty years back, a physics paper will have only two names: the professor and maybe the postdoc or the PhD students. Today, nature papers are typically will have 30, 40, 50 names. So you, you also need for excellent universities, large scale to be able to afford these kinds of uh, multidimensional, multidisciplinary uh, research programs. And the other thing, Rakesh, your point, India has a mentality of sprinkle and pray. Mm -hmm. So you give little bit of money to lots of people. And then you'll get nowhere because nobody uses that money very effectively. So we need, in the US on the other hand, you'll see from time to time, they will do an equivalent of a Manhattan project the cancer project, few centers will get lots of money. NIH funding, yes, they build capacity, but then they have large programs or goes only on to seven or eight large medical research centers. Right, no, I think uh, an interesting discussion. So, so PC, if I, if I may ask you, um, you know, we have uh, 10 odd minutes left in the session. So you look back on your life, you know, you've achieved a lot, but if you had, if I, if somebody gave you a chance to do this all over again, especially your um, philanthropic, the, the initiatives that you've uh, been associated with the ISB and Crest, what, what would you do differently? Or what is the lesson that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah. Oh boy. I made so many mistakes. I cannot count, but on the other hand, if I didn't make those mistakes, I'm not sure I'll have the experience. I'll give you one simple example. You know, I was doing technology-based investments in the early 90s, late 80s. I think it was, according to many, a complete sheer madness to start a greenfield project called Aldia Petrochemical. I even told people that I did it at a moment of insanity. But I think from that challenge, I not only personally grow, but I also see the opportunity to, I think job creation is the greatest philanthropy. And the, the Haldia is actually indirectly has created about half a million jobs in the state of West Bengal, according to the government statistics. And this has happened in, when IPCL got created. So was it a mistake? No, I think, you know, if I share my, anything to share with, with the team, I think taking chances, getting into things that you are not comfortable with, but doing diverse things is a good way to spend your life. You learn a lot and life is all about learning. So my objective on the Gerating Crest is also this way. I'm catching up with my learning because many of these topics, I don't know anything about. <laughs> but I find point. doing Haldia is probably one of the best philanthropic, quote unquote, not philanthropic in terms of making money, but job creating initiative that I have taken. And I feel very good today, although you know, many people that are in the investment world would say, where is the ROI? Probably not right. very high. Yeah, <laughs> some, of the, some of the returns are, are not uh, as tangible as, as uh, the financial world would like us to believe. But I agree with you. I think that's an interesting view. I never thought of it like that. But uh, I think PC makes a very interesting comment that uh, job creation is the best philanthropy uh, that, you know, his experience has taught him um, uh, can be. 
Pramath, how would you respond if you had to do, if you had a, a want to go back and do this all over again? Lessons you've learned that you would like to share with the audience? Rakesh, I, uh, uh, of course, echo everything PC said. And PC is in some ways my guru. So I, I have a lot of respect for him and I listen to him very carefully. But I would only add that I do have a regret uh, and I would have done things differently is that I would have devoted my life whole hog to education much earlier. Uh, I wasn't confident. I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't see it. Uh, it happened by chance. And uh, the last thing I will say is that I also regret that what I do at some level today is still a bit elitist. Uh, if, if I had the wherewithal, and I hope I will one day, and that's what I'm trying to do with this project that I mentioned for the government, I mean, Rakesh, if you and I and PC are worth our salt, uh, we have to get this high quality education to the people who are not getting it. And that really bothers me. Uh, and I'm not saying this out of some bleeding heart charity, but listen, for everything we might blame the government for or the system for, we are extremely, extremely lucky to have gotten the IIT education that we got. And we were just lucky. To, to be born where we were, there are hundreds and thousands and millions out there who deserve the same education. And I don't think we are doing enough. I, I, I said this at a pan IIT many years ago that all of us who got an IIT education have to actually educate. And now with online, I think all of us should be teaching two, three hours a week. Right, we should be running courses. We we can all be a Sal Khan, right? If you know how to teach thermodynamics, hey, I'm sure you'll have takers around the world, right? So I really do think that I wish I could have, I, I, and I am going to do that. I'm not copying out yet, uh, but I really think that I don't. I, I think the generation of us that came out of IIT didn't really see what we were benefiting from and how much we owe and how privileged we are. Uh, and, and it's not about donating money, forget that, right? I'm, I'm not even saying you, you, can, you can donate money if you have, but you can donate time uh, because young people in our country really, really need help in getting to the jobs that Preeti is creating. I think very, very well put. I would, I would say, you know, I, I echo uh, what Pramit says as well. The, the earlier you start to give back in life, uh, you know, it humbles you, but also it teaches you some very interesting lessons of life. Look, I think we have uh, just a few minutes left. Maybe I'm going to pass the floor on to PC. Uh, PC, any concluding remarks uh, for the audience who've joined us today for the session? Well, I think, you know, I mentioned that the IIT diaspora is the most powerful diaspora I know. I think in a way it's even, even more and we have a connectivity is better than I would say the Chinese diaspora since we are always talking about India and China. I think the, the diaspora, if it truly gets engaged in helping India will go very far, which is what Modi ji was saying today. And my appeal, sincere appeal is I'm trying to do something in a very small way. It requires all the support I can get from the diaspora and it is an open platform. We're just getting it started. And we think if ITNs can help, we have a chance. And at least if there is one crest become successful, India will create 10 of them. So I my appeal to the ITNs that are listening, that are talking to other ITNs, please come and help us. Thank you very much, PC. I think uh, on that inspiring and noble initiative that Crest is, I'm sure, will have many takers. And uh, as, as PC rightly points out, all of us, and Pramath rightly says, all of us who had the, the uh, privilege of actually going to the IITs and you know getting the, the, the education we did, um, it is time for us to think about how is it that we can contribute back. So I would request the panelists to not leave the Zoom meeting. I know it's very late for you, Pramath, but we really have the organizing committee that would like to spend a few minutes with us. 
but I want to take this opportunity to thank all the audience that has joined us for this session. Thank you very much. Um, and I pass the floor back on to Ajay. Rakesh, I have one, one thing I wanted to add. Yes, sir. Anybody please. that wants please. to say help Crest, please send uh, your email to pc at tcgcrest.org. pc at tcgcrest.org. Right. And I, I would like to like to get help. Get help. Absolutely. I'm sure there are people who will reach out to you. Um, Ajay? Yep. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Rakesh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pramod. Thank you, uh, Pundendu. This has been an awesome dis uh, discussion. It's very interesting. I found it very interesting, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, so uh, thank you. And I, I'll be reaching out to you. I have some other questions. I will be reaching out to you one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Uh, so Rakesh, thank you for moderating. No, not at all. Thank you.